Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me, and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you for joining me again. Dr. Ben White's here, and we're here today with, Dr. with James Laval, and we'll, we'll be talking about a topic called inflammation. James Laval will explain how chronic inflammation contributes to chronic disease and accelerated biological aging, and of course, all of us want to um, it slow down our chronolo- our biological aging so that we can have a, a, a low uh, biological age in a old chronological age. And so um, uh, this um, topic is inflammation. So what happens is that excess inflammation plays a role in many of the most common chronic diseases, including heart disease, diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases, chronic chronic kidney disease, and even cancer. And among the causes for inflammation, of which there are many, um, include stress, blood sugar imbalances, obesity, gut dysbiosis, chronic infections, periodontal disease, diet, poor sleep, toxins, um, and many of the topics we regularly talk about in the functional medicine world. James Laval is an internationally recognized clinical pharmacist, board certified uh, clinical nutritionist, and the author of more than 20 books. How do you write so many books, James? Um, (laughs) Including Cracking the Metabolic Code. He lectures around the world, or at least he did when we used to have meetings, (laughs) 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 including for the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine and for the George Washington University Masters of Integrative Medicine program, uh, thank you so much for joining me today, Jim. Oh, it's great to be here. And I got two more books coming this year, man. I mean, is I'm that right? Tur- turning and burning, buddy. Wow. It's, 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 it's what are the two man. books you have coming out? I've got uh, Metabolic Code 2.0, which is kind of the updated version of Metabolic Code, uh, which kind of goes through metaflammation. Why, how do we get there? How, well, you know, how do we look at it? And then I, I did a book on biomarkers and sports performance to really, you know, I work a lot with athletes. And I think there's still just such this ignorance of, you know, that it, it, where the bi- biomechanics and biochemistry need to intersect in order to really have a healthy person who's training. And it doesn't matter whether you're a, an amateur athlete or a pro athlete, you know, you can start an inflammation cascade with an injury or you can get injured because you got inflammation chemistry in your body, you know, right. and, and, and I don't think people are, are quite got that yet. So I'm really excited about that book. I, I think uh, that's that's great. That's a book that's definitely sorely needed because I've done some work with some professional uh, sprinters and some other athletes and trying to put together w- which things are best to track is is uh, a bit of a challenge right now. So giving us some guidance on that would be helpful. Yeah, no, it's exciting. And, and uh you know, the world's changed. I think, you know, we've got some really good awareness now of what chronic inflammation is. And I don't want to get into a too heady of a discussion, but I do want people to understand that, you know, we're, we're all, we're all moving towards inflammation as we age. That's what happens. Our immune system kind of starts to decompensate, right? As we age, things don't work as well. Right. Just like you said, you know, uh, you know, we, we want our, we want our chronologic age really up there and our biologic age really back here. Right. And uh, when we don't, when we don't really take care of ourselves the way we need to, or become aware of what's going on with our chemistry, you know, things slip away. People, you know, people start developing chronic illnesses. Yeah, actually, I I think the last week of political inflammation and uh, (laughs) excessive screen watching and and lack of sleep is probably contributing to that. (laughs) We'll add that political inflammation. (laughs) Yeah, you know what? I think that may be number one. I got a lot of people coming in here that are just like, you know, they're beside themselves. And I I just try to tell them, take a deep breath. 
I, 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 now that I'm like, I turned 60 this year. Right. And so I I've seen a lot in my 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's never politics never ceases to amaze me. I'll just put it that way. It's just it's something else. Right. So, you know, so. so so outside of politics, what are the biggest contributors to inflammation? And what, what is inflammation? I so, mean, so when you think of yeah, it's a great question. So so you know, so we can set up, you know, what we're gonna talk about. You know, there's a process called metaflammation, metabolic inflammation. You know, we used to hear the term metabolic, and you'd think, oh. I burn calories or I don't, right? And now there, and, and this is what I wrote about when I wrote the metabolic code book. And obviously what I teach about is systems biology or network biology thinking, which is you have to look at the relationships in your body and understand is my nervous system and immune system in balance? Is that in balance with my hormonal system? Am I absorbing things correctly? What's going on with my detoxification pathways? What's my stress load like? Am I sleeping? What's my hydration like? All of these facets, what, what, I, you know, what I get exposed to, right? I mean, if you're living in California, you know, atrazine, a major pesticide. You know, we spray more patri- uh, atrazine in the state of California than I think the next three states combined. I mean, it's crazy, right? And so, it's interesting. Everybody talks about glyphosate, but atrazine doesn't seem to come up as much. Yeah, I know. And atrazine is number one. Yeah, <laughs> it's the big one. You know, it's making all those tadpoles deformed. <laughs> uh, so, uh, which, and humans, by the way. So uh, there's a, right. there's issues with it. So my point is, is that everything that's going on with you right now, if you're listening where you are right now with your metabolism is really the sum total of everything that's gone on since the time you're in your mother's womb to today. Exposures, emotional stress, physical stress, um, impact of diet, you know, all of these things, environmental burden, all these things are flying in, at, at this, this high level in our body. And they're all trying to keep us uh, sound, you know, just able to age gracefully. But the problem is, is that as we start to get into, I get an infection, I'm on a lot of antibiotics. Maybe I start to develop dysbiosis from candida. Uh, maybe my diet's skewed. Maybe I'm a big, I'm, I'm a big ketogenic uh, dieter and I don't take in any fiber. And, you know, I, maybe I'm starting to make more endotoxin. What happens is we start to push our body towards triggering a neuroinflammatory response, meaning We get sympathetic dominant, right? Because your blood sugars go up, you make more adrenaline. And at the same time, you start to release more inflammatory cytokines. And the inflammatory cytokines are basically the signals that tell your body, you know, hey, we got to fight a good fight. Um, Your body's supposed to turn those off, right? You know, you know, you treat patients every day. Yeah. An appropriate inflammation response should stop and a person resets back to normal. And the problem that we have is that when people stay in a chronically inflamed state, now that can happen just by overtraining, right? You can be perfectly healthy and train too much and put yourself in a chronically inflamed state. Right, and we we need to make clear here, uh, I think that there's a tendency for us to say, inflammation's bad, and we need to understand that inflammation is how the body heals, You know, when you have damaged tissue, the body says inflammatory cells, and that's part of the healing process. Inflammation is how we fight infections. So um, uh, short-term, you know, fluctuations of inflammation are super important for our health. It's just that when those short-term inflammatory states become chronic, that it really becomes a problem, right? And that's, and that's the issue is that when you don't turn the inflammation off, when your body doesn't have the reserve, I like to use terms like metabolic reserve and resiliency and durability. When your body's losing its durability, when it's losing its capacity to turn the inflammation off and say, okay, back to normal, back to homeostasis, there's a bunch of things that start to happen. And so one of the things that start to happen, and I'm seeing this a lot, and I bet you are too, um, is we see disturbances in iron absorption and metabolism. So people have really low ferritin. They don't store their iron anymore. So their reserve for iron is low, but yet their iron store itself is okay. And that's a sign 
that you're metabolically inflamed. That the inflammatory compounds turn off your ability to store ferritin and make EPO, erythropoietin, so you can make new red blood cells. A lot of people don't look at it that way, but I see it in lab tests. I mean, every day I see it in lab I, tests. I see that too, and that's kind of interesting, especially because we also think of ferritin as an inflammatory um, factor. Right. Well, you know, yeah. Elevated it, ferritin being an indication of inflammation. Yeah. And it is right. So once again, if your ferritin's really low, you're more prone for anxiety and arrhythmias and fatigue and headaches and your thyroid receptor can't function right because you need ferritin to allow your thyroid hormone to penetrate the cell. But when it's high, it's toxic. So that happens a lot in insulin resistance, right? People that are insulin resistant, they make a ton of ferritin or if you've got hemochromatosis, but, the, but metabolically, when I'm insulin resistant, I make too much ferritin. When I'm chronically inflamed, I can have high iron and low ferritin and therefore have the signs or the feeling of being anemic. And when you see that adding more iron's not helpful, the key is trying to conquer the inflammation. That's exactly right. So it's understanding what's going on. Now, the next thing that happens uh, is that you lose bone. So when people are under metaflammation, because remember, inflammation is, well, what's inflammation? Okay, I develop heart disease, plaque, plaque in my arteries, triggered by inflammation. I, I lose bone, right? You get osteopenia. I lose muscle, sarcopenia. So the inflammaging term, it's really accurate because all this inflammation that's being, being driven by your metabolism is what's driving those chronic illnesses. So, so we have bone loss and then you get your, ins the insulin receptors don't function appropriately anymore. So all of a sudden you have uh, a disorder in your iron metabolism, you start to lose bone. You start to become insulin resistant, which, you know, is one of the worst things that can happen to your aging processes if you're insulin resistant. Uh, you start to lose your neuroplasticity in your brain. Your neurons don't communicate under chronically inflamed states. And the big one, uh, the other one, it's really easy to see action steps. If everybody says, oh, your lipids don't matter. Your lipids don't matter. Turns out, that when you're metabolically inflamed, you end up making more bad actor lipids. So if you look at Sinatra and Bowden's new book, they're talking about you know, apolipoprotein B and oxidized LDL and all these kind of hidden markers. Well, yeah, those hidden markers, those are the things that are showing you that you're chronically inflamed. So if you're oxidizing your LDL cholesterol, you got a problem with inflammation, you know? It, and, it, and excess oxidation as well. It, and, and absolutely, you're getting your redox potential is, is destroyed, right? Yeah. And so the point being is people, they look at their lipid panel, lipid panel, LDL, HDL, triglycerides. Right. Yeah. And most of the time, even that's messed up. Their triglycerides are too high. Their HDLs right. are too low. Their LDLs are really high. But even if they're not, you really have to Doesn't it drive you crazy when the patients come in and say, look, I had all my labs done. And it's like, yeah. no, you had like five done because that's all your insurance company wanted to pay for. Exactly. Exactly. And so we run, you know, advanced lipid panels on everybody. You know, right. I want to know if they're making those little bad actor lipids like apolipoprotein B. Interesting. Everybody hears about lipoprotein little A and LPA in a non-diabetic population. When it's high, it shows excessive inflammation. Once again, it's what's interesting about labs. In a diabetic population, the lower the LPA, the more progressive the damage. The LP little a? Yes. You're saying if that goes lower? In a diabetic. Interesting. And that's on a big, big study that just came out. I mean, uh, literally, that rocked me, too, because I was really? all about can the you, high LPA, you, high LPA. You, yeah, can you send me a copy of that? Because I, I had a pretty detailed discussion with Dr. James Kahn about LP little a. He wrote a book about it, and uh, that's I'll have a to new show concept. It. It's <laughs> it's on it's on over ten thousand diabetics tracked. Really? Yeah, it's it's pretty compelling data. It's almost I mean I, it, it 
it, it, it continue. I've been studying. I'm in lab. I've been in lab. Like, look. So at how it. how low does the LP little a go? Like normal is like under forty or thirty or something. Yeah. So the lower it goes, like in the twenties, the more you see problems with the diabetic. Interesting. In their vascular network. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm a lifelong student of biomarker trends, right? I mean, that's why I wrote the book, Blood Never Lies, was because we need to look at trends. And so it never ceases to amaze me how we see these issues like really low ferritin bad, really high ferritin bad. LPA in populations that are non-diabetic, when it's high, it's bad. And then when it's low, it's bad in diabetic populations. So I think it's it's important because when you look at metabolic inflammation, here's the end and like the end game, when we cut right to the chase, you get mitochondrial destruction and then you get the differentiation of cells. So what does that mean? It means that you're going to be in a degenerative process and whether that's in a degenerative process that leads you towards heart disease and autoimmune disorder or cancer, as soon as you start to uncouple mitochondrial capacity in your cell, that's where the trouble hits. And that's what happens when you're metabolically inflamed. And I'm sure we're going to talk about, well, what do you do about it? But uh, we've got it. But that's the essence of it is you're, we're on this path as we're aging. You got to rage against the night, man. You got to rage against that inflammation. You got to really work it. Um, I'm still learning. I, I, I mean, every, every day I'm learning something different about what I can do. Uh, to help people turn back that inflammatory signaling. And here's the bottom line. Why is it important? Now, can you hear metaflammation, inflammaging, mitochondrial, you know, neurogenesis, big words. The bottom line is, you know, when you turn inflammation back, people feel better. Right. Their hips don't hurt. They don't have colitis anymore. Their brain's clearer. Their fatigue lifts. I mean, these are big things that uh, for me, when I'm, when I'm working with people, I'm wanting to know how do I change your life? And, you know, I could, I could change their LP to A, right. I could change their LP little A and they'd probably look at me and go, Oh, wow. That's really cool. <laughs> so I don't know what that means. You know, if I get them to poop better and they're out and they, and they feel less stress and they sleep better and their hips don't ache anymore. Right. They're going, yeah, man, you are the man. And right. that, that's why I, I I try to always buffer, uh, you know, highly complex metabolic uh, discussions. Look, we don't even, we haven't even talked about the fact that people eat too much. They eat too often. They eat too late. They pick the wrong foods. They don't get enough sleep, which, tr which triggers inflammasomes in their body, right? They're going to have inflammasomes. And once again, some inflammasomes are good. Some inflammasomes when they're being released too frequently are not so good. And, and, but you know, when we do that by default, just the fact that we eat too much, we eat too often, we eat too late, we're turning off autophagy. And now well, so autophagy, right? I'm, I'm bringing the vacuum cleaner out and cleaning up the waste products of my metabolism. My lymph, now my lymph is congested. Why do I have this lymph adenopathy? Why is my lymph congested? Why am I a puffy sponge? Right. Why do I, because I ask people that all the time. Do you feel like a sponge? Do you feel puffy? Oh, <laughs> how'd you know? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And it's because they're lymphatically stagnant. They're, they're never giving their body an opportunity to clean out waste proteins, nor do a metabolic reset on their inflammatory activity that's dictated by what's called inflammasomes. And we, so we why, why, don't, why don't you explain what's an inflammasome? So inflammasomes are basically another immune um, defense. So if you get a, um, say you get a bug, you know, I got, just got a flu bug. You will have inflammasomes release, which it's good. They release to say, uh-oh, there is a foreign body in you and we need to attack that thing. And so they tag it, right? So the inflammasome's sitting there going like a paintball gun, right? Boom, attack, right? The problem is when they start to attack our normal tissues and we trigger inflammation. So they're paintballing everybody, right? Right. Or and, like when a virus triggers the NLRP3 inflammasome, right? Right. And if you don't have enough, and here's the interesting thing, when you do NLRP3, there's a, it, when it's unrestricted, it creates a cytokine storm, right? So you make all these cytokines, right? Just like what happened with COVID and even another virus. Exactly, right, right, right. right. But you're supposed to have LRP6, 
which is a countermeasure to that that says, hey, you know what? It's not that bad. But when you know, but what happens is, is that if our liver's congested, if our gut is uh, has dysbiosis, we downregulate our counterregulation of inflammasomes that are helping to kind of balance out that response to a vector. And that's why we got into trouble. Uh, you know, in the event, I hate beating, yeah, everybody's talking about COVID, but it's just a perfect example of people that had fatty liver, people that had, were diabetic or pre-diabetic. So they're, you know, they're not efficient at detoxification, people with heart disease. Um, that's why it's one of the reasons why this inflammatory storm took place is they didn't have all their soldiers in line. And so that that's really what I've been really trying to do is get out there and talk to people about, Hey, you got to start to take care of your immune system. You've got to take care of your nervous system because they're driving the bus. They're sending all the signals that tell you, are you going to defend appropriately? Not just for COVID. I mean, let, let, let's face you it. You know what? I know, I, I, I know everybody's been talking about COVID, uh, but really uh, the message you still don't hear very much is the message you just expressed. And, and the best thing that could come out of this COVID crisis is if we uh, understand that the fact that our society is so obese, has such high rates of blood sugar dysregulation, diabetes, all these chronic diseases from, uh, you know, uh, 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 out of balance immune system, et cetera, et cetera, from being, you know, eating a, a horrible standard American diet, not exercising, et cetera, et cetera. And, and realize that if we turned around our health, uh, you know, we would be much more resilient and able to deal with um, viruses like COVID-19 or and, coronavirus. And just live a healthier life, right? Enjoy right. your life. Because, I mean, I think one of the biggest issues we see is that, look, 80% of our population is overweight. We got 42% of our population is obese. 50% of the U.S. population is pre-diabetic or diabetic. You know, 50, you know, 70% 50, are overweight, I think. I actually, got, it's up now. It's up to 80. 80. It, wow. it 80% up. are overweight. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's 80%. Yeah, it's, wow. I wish it was better, but it's not. We we are the, the statistic breakers. <laughs> we better go get some chicken wings, some nachos, some chili <laughs> cheese fries, and a, and a thing of sour gummies, like right now. We got to get caught up. Yeah, and, and it's a problem. And, look, look, my and, brother was a and take your gummy vitamin with it because that'll that'll <laughs> oh, yeah, those are so good. Out. They're really good for you, those gummies. <laughs> you know, it's it's hard because you know, my brother was a 476 pound man. Wow. And you I say mean, he, he was. was obese. He was obese. He was big, he was big, he's just a big mountain of a man, but he was obese. And God rest his soul, he passed away at the age of 62 and uh didn't want to listen to the younger brother too much. He tried. I tried hard, but it was just difficult. He had a lot of things that were in his way. And I think for a lot of people, they don't realize that there's a way out, but the way out involves work. There isn't going to be a pill that gets invented that fixes the situation we're in. Yes, you can manage symptoms. I mean, obviously I'm a clinical pharmacist. I understand drug therapy really well. And that's why I try to avoid it with people as, as much as possible. Use it when you need it, but when you don't need it, Try to change your lifestyle. Try to take some nutrients. Try to manage your stress. Uh, in general, I find that these are the big things that people miss out on. Is I, I even on, on, on the standpoint of getting people to walk, I'd love people to walk an hour a day. I start them on ten minutes. Yeah. I just you know, can you walk? Okay, cool. Can you get in the pool? Okay, cool. Can you do something for ten minutes? Can you just stand up? It's pretty sad, honestly. What yeah, before I started my uh, chiropractic career, I worked at a health club and uh, we used to do sales and uh, we always had the magic pill clothes that we would occasionally use. And that was, wouldn't it be great if there was a magic pill that you could lose weight and get in great shape? Well, there's not. So sign here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. This, I mean, like once again, I kind of grew up in that space a little bit too. And this has to tell me to breathe. <laughs> I'm like, what's up with that? Really? We've lost. I can't tell you how many times when I talk to people, I teach them box breathing, just simple. Cause they're not going to meditate for 30 minutes. I mean, everybody's in a rush. 
But if I could get them to breathe deeply, two to three minutes. So you, you wanted to know, let's use, get some usable stuff here. Number one, you got to breathe deep. When you don't breathe deep, you shut your parasympathetic nervous system down. You don't oxygenate your tissues. You make more lactate in your, in your blood. And that means you're going to be more prone for anxiety. You're not going to oxygenate all your tissues. And, and then you're going to end up staying pretty anxious. When, you, when your diaphragm gets stuck and you don't breathe deep, it's not good. So box breathing, box breathing a couple of times. Look, you could take, um, oh, who is it? Ben, it's another Ben. Uh, he's got a great breathing course. I have to think about who that is, okay. uh, but he just posted it. Um, I, I mean, I'm not a big advocate of like the Wim Hof stuff where you breathe till you pass out. I guess that's to be <laughs> honest. Um, I, I just think that you might hit your head or something. I don't yeah. know, but, but, uh, but for the average everyday, and I'm kind of tongue in cheek, I'm kidding, but, but yeah, but no, not, I know what you're saying, but not, <laughs> but the point is for the everyday person, they don't even have a normal respiratory quotient and no, that, and they're, and they're breathing yeah. through their mouth, not their nose and they're not breathing deep and they're right. So that's big. And that can help your immune system. And it helps you to restore balance in your nervous system. Cause the number one thing that will take you to metaflammation, I, I mean, in my opinion, not, not an, 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 an external toxin. It's obvious that mercury and lead and cadmium and atrazine and glyphosate and, you know, any kind of number of things you get exposed to is going to pump you towards inflammation because it's shutting down enzyme systems in your body right. that then cause a countermeasure of inflammatory signaling. That's one thing. But but to me, the, the uh-oh, what I do? There we go. <laughs> Uh, see that? You see how I kind of zapped out there? I went in my deep breathing. I was there actually four minute break. You didn't even realize it. <laughs> so it's so the so the biggest thing. It's stress response, man. I look at blood pressures and heart rates on everybody. So point number two. Okay, breathe deep is one. Point number two. Look at your resting heart rate. If your resting heart rate is above sixty two, you are sympathetic dominant. Period. It's that simple. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a lot of patients I see in my office. It's, it's so many people, they don't understand it. Like, wait a second, I'm going to see if I'm a good citizen. Let me see. Where am I at? Uh, it's going to be scary. Uh-oh, 55 beats per minute, baby. And that's when I'm excited right now, you know? But I, yeah, but no, I know my resting heart rate is about 50, and I, I had right. surgery in August. And every time my heart rate went below 50, it started beeping and they were freaking out because that's considered so rare. You're an athlete. You're an athlete. <laughs> but, but, but my point is for everybody out there, if you are measuring your heart rate and say you got a heart rate of 70 and a blood pressure of 132 over 88, those are very early signs that you're pumping out too much adrenaline too much noradrenaline, so epinephrine, norepinephrine, your blood vessels are compressing. You're going to end up with, you know, typically the number one type of hypertension is renal hypertension. You lose blood flow to your kidneys, which is going to cause damage to your kidneys and lead to chronic kidney disease, of course. And that's why people with diabetes end up with chronic kidney disease because they pump out so much adrenaline and noradrenaline in their blood vessels. So watch your heart rate, watch your, your blood pressure, and then, okay, I'm breathing shallow. My blood pressure's up. My heart rate's up. What am I going to do about that? Right? Um, before we take a single pill, I got all kinds of supplements I can talk to you about. All kinds of ingredients, man. But you got to get this stuff down. I need you to walk a little bit. You don't have to tear it up. You don't have to like do like carry your CrossFit dumbbell while you're walking on down the street. It's okay. You can just walk. It's okay. Everybody has this all or nothing thing these days where it's like, Hey, if I'm not doing hit training, I'm not really doing a good job. And what I've really, and I'll tell you what, I've been pulling people back from their intense exercise because remember, I got a lot of population of non-athletes, not athletes. They, they should be doing undulating curiosity, meaning alternating their, their, their tension, their intensity, their duration, their type of training, all that stuff should be being done for them anyway. But for us everyday people out there, you know what? It, you know, just start with walking briskly. If you can walk, if you're not in pain, you can't walk, then we got to figure something else out for you. Uh, because I have a lot of people that are just flat out overtrained and they can't figure out why they're losing weight. They're not losing weight and they can't figure out why they're not sleeping. And they keep their, they're keeping their nervous system 
completely jacked up because they're training hard every day. Right. Which is silly, right? Yep. You need that rest. You need that recuperation. Um, so you were talking about stress. What about the whole cortisol, um, adrenal uh, situation? Well, I mean, I spent a lot of time talking about cortisol in my life, and I'm a big proponent that people need to get it measured because there's a couple aspects to cortisol that are a problem. So first of all, you hear this term allostasis, right? This is really important to understand things. Allostasis, for people listening, it's the balance of your stress response from your brain called the HPA axis. Your brain takes in stress appropriately. Hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, adrenal. Yeah. yeah, and, it, and it, it takes in that stress and it kind of dictates what to do appropriately. When you get under sustained stress, and that could be due to infection, it could be due to stress, it can be due to any number of things that we've already discussed. Sustained stress creates something called allostatic load. And the reason I use these terms are these are the terms that are in the literature. They're not like terms like adrenal fatigue, which is a good marketing uh, term, but it's not a real term. It's a marketing term. Allostatic load is when your brain changes the way it responds to the rest of your body due to sustained stress. So it either turns off your stress response uh-oh, my cortisol curve just flattened and now I don't make enough cortisol and I'm chronically fatigued. Or it puts you in a hyper-perseverated state where you're like, oh my God, I've got a white tire chasing me all the time. I'm anxious, I'm nervous, I'm pan panicked, which leads to being tired and wired versus tired and flat. And the, the big point of it all is that you're supposed to have a diurnal rhythm to your cortisol. Up in the morning, down at noon, down more into the evening, turn on your melatonin, so that we balance this circadian nature of our body. And that you measure with a salivary cortisol test. Uh, you have to do a four-point salivary cortisol or a five-point urinary cortisol. Or six, yeah. With yeah, the, you, can do, you can do the cortisol urinary. awakening response, yeah. Exactly, which is pretty important. But the big thing is, is when you flatten your cortisol curve. Right. It doesn't matter whether you're low and flat or high or flat, but when you lose this up, down, and down, right. when it flattens, more risk for heart disease, more risk for diabetes, more risk for cancer, more risk for dementia. So yes. when I lose my body's capacity to go up and down, that's a problem. And a lot of people don't realize that, that your ability to go into deep sleep is basically regulated by the dip in your cortisol. When you lower your corticotropin releasing hormone enough at night, you release growth hormone, you release melatonin, and now all of a sudden I can sleep deep and repair my body. And when you don't do that, when you're having trouble sleeping, when you're stressed out, when you're making too much cortisol, when you flatten the cortisol curve, you do not go into that repair cycle that we talked about at the start of our discussion. You go into repair to turn off that inflammation. And now I don't have a metabolically inflamed state. I have a recovered state because of my sleep pattern. And, and there's a lot of folks that don't realize that when your melatonin, it goes down, it actually controls all of your insulin signaling for the next 24 hours. That's crazy, right? That is crazy. Yep. Yeah. So and that, that's, that's a big issue with diabetics who uh, either see their blood sugar drop too low while they sleep or uh, they get up in the morning and their, you know, blood sugars, uh, 150 or 180 and, you know, they think they're doing right. And sometimes that stress is the, um, underlying factor. Yeah, it's a big culprit. I mean, look, a lot of this is why I ended up developing the metabolic code platform. Why I did the, the cloud-based informatics platform was to take all this data because here's what happens. People, you know, we, he, we see a study on vitamin D. Uh, oh, then we see a study on astragalus. Oh, oh then we see a study on uh, metformin because metformin is the new anti-aging drug of this, the darling of the new world, right? Other than the fact that it can raise methylmalonic acid in your body if you're not careful, which leads to, you know, contributing B12 to B12 deficiency. Growth. Yeah. Yeah. It's a B12 deficiency and you lose CoQ10 too um, and B6. But, but the thing is um, nobody measures all of it together. And that's kind of what we embarked on was, was putting a, an informatic system together that said, what's your symptoms? What's your labs? What are you taking? How are you eating? How are you exercising? So that you can start to see how all of that comes together. Because I look, I, 
doctors always say to me in the you know, kind of traditional medical doctors will say, well, you have no evidence of, a, of dietary supplements. There's no evidence. Right. And, and I go, well, okay. So give me the evidence of when you give somebody ibuprofen, Luvox, metformin, a statin, and, and uh, you know, their Propecia for their hair loss, those right. five drugs. Right. Oh, wait, there's no studies that show those five bot drugs together in your body. Oops. Right. We're, we're all living in this fishbowl, right? We're all, and, and, and we're trying to figure out what are the things that move that person? Like for stress, I got to tell you, I got three big things I use for stress. So once again, you, you made it clear. You're like, hey, make sure you're telling people something they can get and do. I already told them how to breathe. I told them the importance of sleep. I told them about measuring their pulse and their blood pressure. I'm just reviewing it, Dr. Ben. Just reviewing it, buddy. I'm going to make sure you're not going to invite me back sometime. I don't want to be like, caught this trap and all that. That's esoteric. <laughs> so... Thank you, Jim. <laughs> brother Jim. <laughs> Tell us, brother it. Jim. <laughs> That's right, man. We're brothers from another mother, man. So anyway, so so, uh, so the big thing is, uh, is that, look, there's, I think there's three big ones. I mean, theanine is fantastic for people who are perseverators. So if you're somebody who I just can't get, stop making that list, man. I'm going to bed at night. My head is rolling. I'm anxious. Um, even on the verge of panic, but sometimes you got to add kava to theanine in order to really get somebody out of a panic panic. Uh, and, and, and how, how much, good. how much theanine do you like? That's what we're going to, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a big hitter on this stuff because you know, theanine has no adverse event limit. I, I start people if they're significantly anxious, like they're saying, Oh yeah, I'm really anxious. Um, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm, I, I don't sleep at night. I start them at 400 milligrams three times a day. Wow. So I give them a, a, a very use, healthy dose. Use GABA as well or just theanine? Uh, I'll just start with theanine. I okay. mean, I love GABA. I mean, I, I mean, GABA is great. You could do it. You could add it to it if you wanted. But but theanine does such okay. a good job that if you get it at the right dosing okay. threshold. 400 milligrams, milligrams three times a day. Okay. It nails it. And then they can take it as they feel better. I teach people as they're learning to breathe deep and understand their stress response get themselves thinking right about the issues they have in their life. Now they start to bring that theanine back and I start to get them to say, Hey, when do you, you know, use it when you need it. If you're, if you're managing your everyday life, don't feel like, Oh, I got to take my theanine or I don't have my act together. Use it as you need it because you're going into a heavier week. I, I you know, I, I had a really heavy week this week, you know, and, and uh, you know, fortunately I was taught how to give stress and not take stress on. So I don't need to take anything. <laughs> Uh, but I, everybody around me, I give bottles. Of <laughs> so, uh, I think my staff would tell the same story. <laughs> exactly, man. I know I can tell already, <laughs> but, but, but so the next one is Relora. Relora. I did a lot of the human research on initially when it, uh, when it first came to market and actually did, uh, did some good human research on it. And the reason you go for Relora is if you're stressed and eating, so if you're like, hey, man, I get home at four o'clock and I hug the potato chip bag. I mean, I just love my potato chips. So I love it. I eat the potato chip bag and I lick my finger to get the last crumbs out of it. Right. Uh, or, or, you know, or it's that person that eats that cookie and they go, oh, wow, that's a good cookie. I'm going to have just one more cookie. They eat a second cookie. And they go, you know what? I don't like even numbers. I think I'm going to just go to three because like, I don't like two, three is a better number for me. I, I won the lottery with it once. So I'm going to have a third cookie. So we rationalize our, our need for that food. And literally what's happening is you're taking that food and it's almost like you're rubbing it on your head. And I know almost everybody's experienced this because I've been asking this question for a long time. People eat past the gastric sensation of being full in order to turn off the reward cascade due to stress in their brain. Relora is without a doubt, hands down, the best herb to shut down hedonic eating urge and, and reduce stress-induced weight gain, which occurs when people start to have that kind of behavior of, you know, eating for stress, you know, e e eating for stress response. The third one, uh, holy basil for stress. And that's mainly I'll do that more if people are having more GI symptoms like irritable bowel, 
I'll use it. And then I'll combine them. Hey, I got irritable bowel and I eat out of control. All right, Relora plus Holy Basil. You know, so those are the three biggies. Uh, dosing wise on Relora, it's 250 milligrams three times a day. The dosing on Holy Basil, typically if it's a standardized, the, your, your solic acid, uh, it's two to 400 milligrams, unless it's a super critical extraction, then it gets a lot smaller. But the typical Holy Basil out there, two to 400 milligrams, three times a day. Uh, so that's a biggie. And then the other one is don't be afraid to dose your melatonin high to send that signal to turn that body circadian rhythm around, right? You, you know, I've, I've taken melatonin up to pretty high doses on some people in order to what's, kind of- What's a high dosage, like 20 or- I've gotten, I've done up to 30, but I'll do 20 pretty regularly. But once again, you know, sometimes patients about, get nightmares with that. They, usually they get nightmares or they'll get um, like vivid dreams when they haven't had enough. So like they usually get nightmares and dreams at six milligrams. And then I give them 10 or 20 and they go, bam, I was out now. So that's a transition state. And it could also be low B vitamins when that happens. But the interesting thing is, is I don't want them to stay on, although there's a lot of evidence that staying on higher levels of melatonin for, for viral support, kidney support, intestinal support, helping with neural regeneration. It's kind of coming out now that melatonin is not a bad thing to take, but I still end up encouraging people as you sleep better and manage your stress better during your day, that really helps you to you know, cut back on your melatonin. See how little you need. Do you need it at all? Are you sleeping restfully without it? The purpose of all this is to really get people back to homeostasis. You turn on inflammation, you're supposed to turn it off. When I don't, when I, when I have too much stress coursing through me, when my insulin is high because of my eating practices, eating too much, eating too often, eating too late, drinking fruit juice, eating too much fruit. I mean, you know, holy cow, there's so many things. But the point is, you know, you're trying to get that lifestyle corrected. And yeah, what else can I do? Like black ginger, man, black ginger, one of the best things, five times more potent at turning on the cert one pathway for your mitochondria than resveratrol, black ginger. And one of the hallmark traits of being metabolically inflamed now black ginger down regulation is, of that black ginger is different than the typical ginger root that people buy in the store yes it is yeah it is so it's thai ginseng is what it the other name for it yeah, oh, it's different. Okay. yeah so it's it's different and it, i mean so there's some i think really cool compounds that are coming out that i think if we start to look at this metabolic model and go, all right, where, where's the inflammation hanging out? What are the levers that I need to pull in order to help that patient? Or if you're trying to help yourself, where, where am I falling short? You know, am I feeling stressed? Do I feel edgy? Am I having trouble sleeping? What's my diet like? And, you know, we got a lot of pundits out there on diet. You know, everybody gets on and if they're good at Facebook, they can be the next big diet. And it may have only been that it worked on them. There's no, there's no science behind it. Do you remember the cabbage soup diet? Oh yeah. What about this? What about the celery? Uh, oh, the know, celery juice, juice. Celery juice. Yeah. It fixes. Did you know celery juice fixes everything? We should really go find something. <laughs> else to do. Seriously. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, absolutely I mean, everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then the ice cream and tuna fish diet. That was the funniest <laughs> one. You know, that one like, I don't eat, all the ice cream you want, eat all the tuna fish you want. <laughs> like three days later, you throw up, you're not hungry, you lose weight. Right? <laughs> I can't imagine it. I mean, it's crazy. But 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 the point that but honestly, you know, I, I've become really passionate about trying to get people to understand that controlling your HPA axis, you know, regulating cortisol. And here's the thing. You know, cortisol is pretty interesting. You know, pesticides like atrazine has had studies that show that it raises your cortisol and resets your HPA axis. Is that right? Interesting. Yeah, yeah it's it's really, I, I think we really have to start to step back and go, you know what? The, the guys that I learned this stuff from 45 years ago, I mean, Dr. Wood uh, just recently passed away. Super bright guy. And, you know, he made it pretty simple. It's like, do the inventory. Or right, have you been exposed? What have you been exposed to? What is your stress like? What is your sleep like? 
What is your absorption? Is your gut broken down? A lot of people don't realize you get a TB, <clears throat> TBI or you get under a lot of stress, your gut gets leaky automatically. So if you hit your head, your gut's leaky within 10 minutes. If, you, if you're under stress, sustained stress, those inflammatory cytokines go up and it sends a signal to the tight junctions. You know, we got those tight junctions in between our mucosal cells and it breaks them. And when you get leaky gut, you often get leaky brain as well. So those same chemicals end up affecting your brain function. Exactly. Leaky gut, leaky brain, leaky arteries, right? Yeah. So, and, and I think it's incredible when you think about it because one cell layer thick, one cell of the, uh, the enterocyte of the intestine, the endothelial lining of your artery, the blood brain barrier, it's only one cell layer thick and they are incredibly vulnerable to inflammation and immune attack. And when you compromise those one cell layer thick borders, that's when we start to really get into trouble. And I, I'll tell you one of the big things I do for people today, I'm always doing food allergy panels where I'm looking at not just IgE and IgG, but I'm looking at IgG4 and I'm looking at the C3 BD complements because what I'm finding is that people's immune systems are loading up significantly. They're, they're just, you know, they, they, they're reacting to peanuts, but because their IgG4 is protecting against that reaction, you don't have anaphylaxis, but you have a lot of immune dysregulation going on. And if you look at the immune complement pattern against IgG, if you've got a, a C3 complement activation, you have 10,000 times higher immune response to trigger inflammation than if you don't create that complement yet. So working on people's guts. So which, which food reality. sensitivity panel do you like to use? Well, the only one that does that is Infinite, uh, Infinite Allergy Labs. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, they're out of they're out of Georgia, and they they re really just started um, testing. Oh, I don't know the last six months. I do some education for them because I really like the the data that they're putting out on that C3 complement because it shows a high affinity towards the development of autoimmune disorders. Uh, so you have a complement immune response to your food. And then you have an allergic response. So you've got an inflammatory process going on and an allergic process going on. And that when you characterize the two of those together in people, man, it's, it's gold. I mean, it really makes a difference for people. Um, I wanted to touch uh, briefly on some of the labs that you uh, mentioned. And I looked at your slide presentation on metaflammation and, uh, one of them I thought was really interesting was this MPV, mean platelet volume, is not something I normally pay any uh, a lot of attention to. Nobody does. <laughs> That's why I'm a blood geek. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's it's interesting. Um, mean platelet volume, the as it goes up, it is a marker for metabolic inflammation. So that we're changing the volume size of our platelet. That is happening because of inflammatory signaling. And, and so you can look at MPV on your regular old, I, I think it's funny. And Ben, I know, I, I know, because I, I we've talked on, on previously, you look at labs and so many people, they look at a CMP and a CBC and they go, oh, you don't get anything from that. You got to do an organic acid urine. You got to do right. a neutral valve. I'm okay with that. Don't, I'm not criticizing that. I think that people have not learned how to, how to read labs that are actually very well validated, easy to get and cheap, and have big science behind them that proves the metabolic model, right? So MPV, get it in your, you know, the, 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 that one, <clears throat> and getting a differential with your white blood cells and looking at your monocytes, eosinophils, and basophil percents, you can tell if somebody's metabolically inflamed. So uh, uh, an elevated MPV, you're saying, is an indication <clears throat> of meta inflammation. That's correct. Okay, that's right. And then when it when it comes to the uh, white blood cells, I, I know there's different ratios, uh, lymphocyte to monocyte ratio, and which which one or what or 
uh, which ones of those ratios do you think are most significant? You know, I, I actually go by uh, the, the, my big drivers, two things, where your neutrophils at, are they, are they below the second quartile? If you're okay. under, if you're under the second quartile, your immune system is being chronically loaded and you're, and you're, you're basically um, overstimulating your, your immune system all the time. So that neutrophil drop in is not good. I go by percent monocytes, eosinophils and basophils, because I know once there's an inflammatory process going on, I add the three of those up, MEBs. And if the MEBs are greater than, I used to try to get people to get down to seven. Now I'm happy if I can get them under 10 because so many people have chronic eosinophilia, which is a hallmark trait of metaflammation. Their eosinophils are trending high, but they're not full-blown allergic. Uh, and then their monocytes are activated because of their gut food response. And then you look at their basophils because that's even a, when that gets high, you even have a deeper immunologic shift. So you add the three of those up. If it's over nine, you got metabolic inflammation going on. And it's really a simple thing that you can do. And I think, is it, is it, lymph I always screw up these <clears throat> ratios, but is it the lymphocyte to neutrophil ratio that's a bad prognostic marker for heart disease and certain other, con for a cancer and certain other conditions? Yeah, that's correct. That's okay. right. Yeah. So I, it's a big, I mean, I think that, I think it's also a marker for like uh, uh, immune. Um, uh, it's autoimmune behavior. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because that's one of the things that happens with aging is our, our thymus gland tends to shrink. We get a decrease in our immune function, which is why older people uh, tend to be more vulnerable to infections. And that's why everybody's jumping on that bad wagon and taking peptides, right? Because everybody's injecting thymus and alpha-1. They're looking at thymus and beta-4, which I think are great. I mean, I, I, I think peptides are kind of the new undiscovered frontier. Who knows how the regulation is going to go? But what you could do, you can take thymus extract, freeze-dried, lyophilized thymus extract from New Zealand. I've been doing that for patients and giving that out for cold and flu season for years. It's never failed me. You got to gotta strengthen that thymus. You're 100% right. Which is, is there a particular brand that you trust for that? I use uh, professional health products for that because they've been importing New Zealand glands, freeze-dried and lyophilized glands. And they're medical grade over there. So they're veterinary extracted. If any of the animal is diseased, the whole, all of it gets destroyed. So, you know, the glands go, the meat goes, it all goes. There's none of that risk uh, that I see. Oh, the glands over here are fine. It's just they're ate up with cancer in the rest of their body. But the <laughs> glands good. Uh, yeah, you don't want that. And, and the lyophilization and freeze drying is important because it keeps the signal substances that are within the gland intact. And I think that's really where the value of the gland is that is that you so get this freeze dried thymus gland is is a way to get some of these intact peptides without yeah. actually getting yeah, having a to do the injection yeah yeah without getting a prescription and having to do right. the injection I mean obviously I teach you know I I teach peptides at A4M at the American Academy right. of Anti Aging uh, and obviously they're under scrutiny I mean California right now you can't even send peptides in here right now so you you know patients can't get peptides in the state of California what yeah, yeah, they what, shut what, down. They oh, shut really? down. You can't get the BPC one fifty seven either. Orally, orally, but, yeah, okay, but not, yeah, not injectably. And you know, and I'm a big guy following pharmaceutical laws. I mean, I, you know what? There's plenty of things to use that you can get that are safe, especially if you're a practitioner that you that you help with people. You know, so that that's kind of. But it's just it's a transit it's a transition experience right now as I see with peptides because you got a lot of them on the market with big pharma right? 150 applications for new drugs are all peptides right now. Uh, and so obviously there's some, you know, there's some finagling going on around, you know, hey, what's good, how are we going to apply this? How are we going to use them? But they're, they're interesting compounds, I have to say. And BPC-157 seems to be one of the most popular, or probably the most popular peptide. It's very popular and it's interesting. It's, it's incredibly popular, I think, for good reason. Uh, when my son got injured, he had a Liz Franck injury. I got him back in five months. from wow. uh, and, and he was spinning on the foot that was injured. And he won the state discus championship huh. in the state of California. Five months out from a Liz Franck. And you know, that's 
pretty impressive, right? Yes. Uh, and I wish I could say it was me. Uh, I had a great orthopedic surgeon, but he was using BPC-157. And uh, it worked really good to help restore tissue and, and help him in terms of his inflammation on his ligaments and tendons. So he did great there. It's great for healing the gut. Um, but once again, BPC-157, not a lot of human data on it yet. And that's the criticism right. for it. Yep, you know, yep, yep. That, that, I mean, that, that's a fact. It's like, let's give it to a couple hundred people and let's see what they do. You know? <laughs> I mean, let's just publish something. I mean, I did take a lot of heat off that. Now, I do understand that several of those are being nominated right now in the compounding world. And I think that's going to help uh, with you know the ability of it, the availability for it. Right. Okay, cool. I think that's a wrap, Jim. Any final thoughts you want to leave our listeners, viewers? Well, I think I think the biggest thing is is taking care of your body. It's work, but it's worth it. You got to take care of yourself. Yes, it's work. You know, if you got a nice car, you go out and you wash it every day. If you take five months to decide what your next refrigerator you're going to buy is, take a little time each day, apply it to your health. And it'll be the best thing that'll pay off for you is when you feel good, you're in less pain, you feel more clear, you lose some weight, and you're less vulnerable to a lot of the things that uh, take us down as we're aging. That's great. And how can folks get a hold of you? Uh, obviously, JimLaval.com is very easy. Uh, and then if they're interested in our cloud-based information and what we've done, MetabolicCode.com. So those are the two easy ones that they can uh, get a hold of me. And then your books are available from Barnes and Noble, Amazon, yeah, et cetera. Amazon, all that good stuff. And uh, got new ones coming out. We got uh, just repurposed 16 ebooks that I'm bringing out this uh, launch, the first seven. So uh, we're rolling. Wow. Looking forward to seeing those. Thanks, Jim. All right. All right, Ben. 